for today's title is the price has been paid. Hallelujah. Everyone say the price has been paid. That's it. So we see that we were talking from Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53. And we see that everything that God is going to do, he has already done it. Hallelujah. That's why Jesus didn't say to be continued on the cross. He said, it is finished. I'm done. I'm going to the right hand of God and I'm sitting down and I'm going to rest to all of my enemies are made my footstool. Now, how are Jesus' enemies made his footstool? Through the church. Every time the church walks in who they are in Christ and defeats the devil, the devil and his enemies are made the footstool of Jesus. And God's people said... All right, now, so the price has already been paid. It's time for the body of Christ to walk in their inheritance. One thing is reading your inheritance. Another thing is walking in your inheritance. A heavy, heavy, heavy price was paid for you so you can walk in it. Hallelujah. Not just so you can just have it as decoration on your wall somewhere. It's so you can experience and walk in your inheritance. And we see that... This message the Lord gave me concerning the price has been paid in 2016 in a hotel room in North Carolina. Hallelujah. I was dreaming. How many have dreams in this house? And if you don't, give them prophetic dreams in Jesus' name. So December 2016, North Carolina. What month? What year? What state? Hallelujah. I was there sleeping and I had a dream. And in the dream, I saw myself preaching to thousands of people. And as I was preaching, I was preaching with the anointing of God. Hallelujah. And as I was preaching with the anointing, I heard myself. I saw myself. I was looking at myself saying, the price has been paid for your salvation. And then I was saying, the price has been paid for your healing. And I said, the price has been paid for your deliverance. Amen. Hallelujah. I woke up and I've been preaching that message for six years. Because I just robbed the message from the dream. And I started preaching, the price has been paid. The blood has been shed. And God's people said, and you guys can preach the same thing. It's not my message, it's the Lord's message anyway. You tell people, the price has been paid. For your salvation. The price has been paid for your healing. The price has been paid for your deliverance. The price has been paid so you can prosper. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Thank you, Jesus. Now, so we see in Isaiah 52, verse 14, it says, Just as many as were astonished at you. So his visage was marred more than any man. And his form more than the sons of man. That's Isaiah 52, verse 14. We see there Isaiah talking about Christ on the cross. He's describing Jesus um, 700 years before Jesus even was born. And he's looking a prophetic picture of the cross. The Holy Spirit is showing him the future. And he says that his, he was astonished, that people will be astonished at Jesus. Not because of the signs and wonders, but because his visage. Do you guys see that there? His visage. His visage means what? His appearance. The way Jesus looked on the cross. It says it was not to be desired. There was no beauty in the natural. Because it says his visage or his appearance was marred. Everyone say marred. Marred means disfigured. Jesus was disfigured on the cross for you. He was beaten so bad. You understand? They ripped his beard. He had swellings all over the place because they, they were striking him. Uh, his bones were exposed. It was not a pretty picture. So the bottom line is that Jesus was disfigured. It says there more than any man. Think about that. More than a human being, the way a human being looks. You couldn't even recognize Jesus because he was disfigured. Why did Jesus do that? Why did he do that for you and I? Amen. So his visage, his appearance was disfigured. So your face or your image can be what? Refigured. Are you with me? He was disfigured, so yours can be refigured. Refigured means what? To be made over, to be redesigned. Hallelujah. Your image was restored when Jesus died on that cross. In Genesis chapter 1, God said, let us make man how? In our image, our likeness. Correct? Adam and Eve were made in the image and likeness of God. What happened? Sin came in the picture. 
And what happened? It marred or disfigured the image of Adam and Eve. Not physically, but spiritually. Spiritually, they were made in the image of God, but now sin is in the way which, and you know sin is dirty. Sin makes you look ugly. So now they were disfigured. And the cross of Jesus Christ brought that which was disfigured and now refigured the thing and gave you back the image and likeness of God. And God's people said, Amen. Jesus came to restore, to redeem, to bring us back to the original place. Amen. Hallelujah. Redemption is bringing you back to plan A. Hallelujah. God had a plan with humanity. Sin got in the way. And now God is in the plan of restoration. And the restoration began at the cross. Hallelujah. I said restoration began at the cross. So he paid the, pr he paid the price and did everything he's going to do to save you. There's nothing else for Jesus to do. He's done everything to save you. Now you just have to receive it by faith and walk in it by faith. So his face was disfigured so yours can be refigured. So you could be redesigned. Or let's put it this way. If any man is in Christ, he's a new uh, creation. Hallelujah. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That means the, the old image is done away with because now you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Thank you, Shelly. You're the only one that got it. You are God's masterpiece. Say, I'm God's masterpiece. The word workmanship means masterpiece. Say, I am God's masterpiece. Say, I'm fearfully and wonderfully and skillfully made. Meaning God took time with you. He bore my sickness. You know that in verse 4. Surely he took my griefs, which means sickness. He carried, bore means carry. He carried my sickness away. So if Jesus took my sickness and carried it on the cross for me, why am I carrying a thing? Either he's carrying it or I'm carrying it. We both ain't going to carry the thing. And Jesus is hanging on that cross, for example. And if he looks at you carrying what he's carrying, he says, what are you doing with that? I'm carrying it for you. Let go of that. I bore sin. I bore sickness. I bore iniquity and transgressions. What are you doing carrying something that I already took for you? Hallelujah. What are you doing carrying depression? I took it for you. Why are you carrying oppression? I took it for you. Why are you carrying sickness? I took it for you. Why are you carrying the curse and poverty? I took it for you. And God's people said, yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Right. You see why I could preach bold? Because it's the word. If it wasn't in the word, I have to hold back. But it's in the word, so I let the thing go. Hallelujah. He took it for me. And I'm, I'm not even telling you, I'm not even teaching you how to access it. I'm just telling you what's yours already. You might say, I'm not experiencing that. Okay, I understand that. There, there are biblical principles how to receive those things that have already been paid for. But what I'm saying, I just want to give you these next, this last week and this week, next week, I just want to give you what's yours. I want to know what's in, I want you to know what's in your will, what's in your covenant. So that you don't remain ignorant. Ignorant doesn't mean stupid, it just means that you don't know what's yours. I want to announce it. Like a trumpet, hallelujah. That the price has been paid. Oh, pastor, I'm depressed. Pastor, I'm oppressed. The price has been paid. Listen, receive it, even if you don't receive it for yourself. Receive it for Jesus' sake. Hallelujah. If I was sitting there like you, I'd be going crazy right now. Receive it. Tell the person next to you, receive it. For Jesus' sake. For the sake of Christ. Because he paid a heavy price for it. Hallelujah. He paid a heavy price. And the Bible says in Isaiah 53, he shall see the labor of his soul. Meaning he's going to see. You receive what he paid for. Yeah. Hallelujah. Verse 11. That's Isaiah 53 verse 11. He shall see the labor of his soul and be what? Satisfied. Hallelujah. You guys better see it in the word. 
Jesus is going to be satisfied. Because he's going to see, I paid the price, they received it, and they're walking in it. Hallelujah. That brings satisfaction to the heart of the Son of God. Hallelujah. Lord, let it hit them like a ton of bricks. Hallelujah. I pray that you get the spirit of revelation. Not just knowledge in the head. That the thing explodes on the inside of you. The word of God has to explode on the inside of you. Once it explodes on the inside of you, that's called revelation. That's what it's Yo, I got the thing. I heard it like a thousand times. I got it today. Hallelujah. I pray you leave this place. I got it today. You know how many times you can hear truth, but it don't hit you. They will come that day in certain things that you have heard. That's going to hit you. I say, yo, I remember pastor. Yo, pastor, that was a great one. Yes, I preached that six years ago. I, I, you heard it six years ago, but now it hit you like a ton of bricks. It became revelation. Hallelujah. And it, only when it becomes revelation, it's yours. And now you can walk in it. <sighs> Hallelujah. So he was wounded. Verse 4. He took my griefs. Verse 5, he was wounded for my transgression. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement for my peace was upon him, and with his stripes I'm healed, right? So he was wounded, he was bruised, he was chastised. Correct? Wounded. Wound, wounds. He was wounded on the outside, you know, with his stripes. We heal. He whipped them on the back. So not only was Jesus wounded, Jesus was bruised. Bruised there means crush. But let's rewind. Wound is one thing on the outside. Bruise, when you got a bruise, what happens to that bruise? It turns what? Black and what? A purple, blue. Why? It's bruised on the inside. So now you need outer healing, but you really need... And Jesus has paid the price so you can be healed internally and externally. And God's people say... No, but I want to talk about the internal, not just physically, even though that applies to that, emotional healing. There's many people, millions and millions of people that have been wounded and bruised internally. Trauma from childhood. And people can't continue walking forward in what God has done for them or, or, or you know, walk in what he paid the price for because of the trauma of the past. But I want to tell you this afternoon that the price has been paid for you to be healed of that inner trauma that was done to you as a child. There's healing at the cross for the broken heart. That's facts and that's the word. Luke chapter 4, Jesus said this. Remember, you don't have to turn to it. In Luke 4, in verse 18, what happened? That he went to the synagogue. They gave him the scroll. Open up the scroll. Hallelujah. They gave him the scroll. He began to read Isaiah 61. And what he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to do what? Heal the brokenhearted. So Jesus is anointed to heal the broken heart. A broken heart means a heart that's been shattered in pieces. And the anointing of God will grab the, that which was shattered and make it whole and mend it together. All right, that's by the anointing. It's by the anointing. Look, we can help people and, and counsel them and stuff, but listen, there's, time, there's things, there's some wounds that counseling ain't going to help. It's the anointing of the Holy Spirit that's going to bring healing in that soul. And that anointing comes from God. So what do we have to do? Lord, anoint me. Lord, anoint me with your anointing because your anointing heals the broken heart. Are you with me? The anointing of God heals the broken heart. And let me tell you something. Some people are sick physically because they're sick emotionally but if you get the emotions healed and the trauma healed all of a sudden the body lines up and is healed naturally if you heal the internal part the external part gets healed automatically and the doctors say that you don't have to be a believer for that they tell you scientists tell you and doctors tell you they'll tell you that that most sicknesses and disease is internal meaning from wounds unforgiveness bitterness resentment and Jesus paid the price to heal unforgiveness, to heal resentment, to heal bitterness, and take bitterness from the root and yank the thing out by the power of God. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. 
Listen, if you open up your heart, not to man, not to a religion, not to a denomination, to Jesus. If you open up your heart to Jesus, he heal internally and go straight to the root and rip out that bitterness in Jesus' name. So in Hebrews chapter 6, are you guys enjoying this? Okay, look at verse 9. He says, but beloved, we are confident of what? Better things concerning you. Meaning, not, you're not straying away from the law. We're confident that you're going to continue walking with God. But watch this. Yes, concerning you. Yes, things that do what? Accompany what? Though we speak in this manner. So he's saying there are things that accompany salvation. Hallelujah. There are things that accompany salvation. Meaning, you got saved, you received a new heart, a new spirit. Amen. But there are other things that accompany this salvation. Are you guys getting it? There are other things. It's not just, I'm saved, I ain't going to hell, hallelujah, amen, and you stop there. But you're still suffering from oppression, you're still suffering from depression, you're still suffering from sickness, you're still walking down and out. I can't wait to get to heaven. That's, all, that's, that's your doctrine. You just, I'm saved, that's it. I'm saved, but I can live like a devil. No, it's more than that. Or I'm saved, and then you just park there. But you're not experiencing any of the benefits of the inheritance that has been given unto you. I tell you about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Say, no, I don't believe in that. That's part of your inheritance. Okay, you don't want it, that's fine. But there are things that accompany salvation. There are other things that belong to you. Hallelujah. It's not just the saving of your soul. It's walking in the glory of God. And walking in your inheritance. An inheritance is given to be possessed. An inheritance is not given so you can just frame it on a wall somewhere. When your loved one dies, correct? Leaves you a will. If they left property for you, you don't grab the will and just put it on the wall and say, oh, look how beautiful. And you frame it. He said, look at my inheritance. And you just frame it. Look, he put my name on it. This belongs to me and this belongs to me. And you just have it framed in your house. No, you want to go in and possess what that property is. What is it that he left me? He left me the dog Larry. What else he left me? You know, everything (laughs) is the inheritance is to be possessed, right? To take possession, to take hold of. And to enjoy it. When God spoke to Joshua, he gave them rhema word. What was the rhema word? Possess this land. This He gave them specifics on what each tribe, which cities they were supposed to possess. So he told them exactly. It was a rhema word. So God was expecting, once he gave them the word, this is yours. He was expecting for them to get up and go possess it. First, before possession, dispossess, then possess. Dispossess, drive out the previous tenant and possess what I'm giving you. So what are we doing? Once we find out the will of God, we're going in and dispossessing the devil from our lives. You can take the spirit of oppression. It's not mine. So let's say you operate in the spirit of depression, spirit of oppression, or spirit of infirmity, the moment you find out, oh my God, Jesus carried this and I've been carrying this, the moment you find that out, that's the moment you begin to dispossess the devil in your life. You begin to say, no, no, this spirit of infirmity don't belong to me. In the name of Jesus, I'm healed. So what am I saying? Once I find out what's in my inheritance, that's when I can begin to dispossess. That's when I can begin to release my faith because I know it's the will of God that I be walking in total shalom. Are you with me? So over here he says, there are things that accompany salvation. So salvation is just the beginning. And I'm almost done, five minutes. It's like entering a theme park. It's just the beginning. How many have been to Disney here? Magic Kingdom or whatever park, Epcot, whatever. Okay, the Bush Gardens. I'm going local now. What am I saying? The moment you buy the ticket and the price has been paid, you can go into the theme park. But you don't stop at the entry of the theme park and say, wow, I pay for all this. And you just stay right there. You want to say, hey, dummy, you want to go? There's a lot that you pay for. 
get on the cheetah, go get on the shikra, and all the other stuff, the other rides. Right? You pay for the whole theme park. You're not just there looking at it. We receive an inheritance. The price has been paid. Not so we can just look from afar. No, no, you got to go in. And what do you do when you're in a theme park? You get online and you got to wait to get on the ride. Yes or no? So it's going to require, look at verse 12. It says that you do not become what? Sluggish. Hebrews 6, 12. But imitate those who through what? Faith and patience inherit the what? The promises. It's going to require what? Faith and what? Patience. So it's like you're online waiting for the ride. You're going to require what? Faith and patience. It doesn't mean you can't get on a ride, but you need faith and patience. Waiting your turn. Hallelujah. And they are tailor-made blessings for you, and you're just waiting for your turn to come up. Amen. God has a season where he manifests every prophetic promise in your life. There's a season for it. If he promised it, he'll bring it to pass. Everything has a season. It will come to pass in Jesus' name. If God said it, if man said it, if God said it, it shall surely come to pass. Write the vision down. Make it plain that he who reads it may run with it. Though it tarry, wait for it, for it shall surely come to pass. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Galatians chapter 4. Now I say that the heir, you guys got it? Galatians chapter 4, before the book of Ephesians. Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. That now I say that the heir, say I'm an heir. Okay, an heir is what? An inheritor. Someone who what? Inherits. I say that the heir, as long as he's a what? Does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. So right here we see, you can be an heir of God and join heir with Christ. But as long as you remain a child in the spirit, immature in the spirit, there's no difference with you and a slave. That's what it says. Though he's master of all. Hallelujah. Tell the person next to you, Next to you, you are master of all. Come on. Come on. Who's the master? I am. The last dragon. Show enough. 1984. All right, Leroy. Who's the master? Leroy didn't know. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie. Leroy didn't know. His uh, karate instructor was trying to show him that he's the master, but he didn't realize it. Later on, this other guy thought he was the master, but he's not. He got the revelation. Finally, the guy almost was killing him, was almost drowning him. He said, all right, Leroy, who's the master? Finally, he got it. He said, I am. And when he did that, he just beat the other guy up. He turned, <laughs> electricity came out. That's the anointing of God. Have you never seen that movie? Anyway. All right, Leroy, who's the master? I am. Guys, I'm here to tell you and announce you are the master of all. You have authority and power given to you to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. That's a fact. You are a priest and a king in Christ. Revelation chapter 1 says you have been made a king and a priest. You're not going to become, you already are. Been made the instantly, the moment you got saved, you were made a king and priest. You just don't know it. Why? Because it says, as long as he's a child, as long as we don't know what's part of our inheritance, as long as we don't know the word of God, as long as we stay spiritually immature, spiritually babes, spiritual babes, we don't grow and find out what belongs to us. So what happens? There's no difference between you and a slave. And when a slave, when we talk about slaves... Slaves equals, slavery equals bondage, right? Yoked up, burdens, correct? Okay. The unbeliever. There should be a difference between the believer and the unbeliever. Even God says in, in Exodus, I will make a difference between my people and the Egyptians. The Egyptians suffered all the ten plagues, not Israel. 
The ninth plague, thick darkness hit the land of Egypt. Not the children of Israel. They had light in Goshen. Tico was still on over there. But in Egypt, they unplugged the thing. There was no light. Every plague, ten plagues that were hit in Egypt, all the Egyptians experienced the plagues. Not Israel. They were blessed. They were protected by the hand of God, protected by the blood of the Lamb. So what am I saying? You shouldn't be experiencing that which the world is experiencing. Because you are in covenant with God. You are a son of God. Hallelujah. There is a difference. There shouldn't be, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus, but I'm just as depressed as the unbeliever. I'm oppressed, I'm depressed, I'm sick. Hallelujah. No. There has to be a difference. So, but as long as he remains a child, he's no different from a slave. So what that tells me, yo, I got to grow spiritually. Because if I don't grow spiritually, even though I'm a believer, even though I got a covenant, I'm still suffering from slavery. Uh, how you say? I'm still suffering from the symptoms of slavery. Yeah, I, I'm still thinking like a slave, acting like a slave, talking like a slave, and experiencing slavery even though I've been set free. Don't be like that elephant. There was an elephant from small. They had him in a cage. So what happens, when he was small, they would put a little chain to hold him in. What happens, the, the elephant would try to go out, and he was chained. He couldn't move because he was small, and the chain was too strong for him. But as he grew up, what happened? His mindset was, I can't get out of this cage because I'm chained up. But he didn't realize he was stronger now. He was bigger now. He could have broke that chain easily. And you know what else he didn't realize? When he was small, they chained him. When he was bigger, they, he wasn't chained anymore. But his mentality, he still felt chained and he stood right there, though there was no chain to his leg. And being a big, grown, full-grown elephant, he stood in this little cage and wouldn't come out. Because his mindset, his mindset, Israel came out of Egypt, but their mindset did not change. They were still thinking as slaves. So when we come to God, we have to renew our minds. You're no longer of Egypt. You're no longer of the world. You come to the kingdom of God. Now you have to renew your mind and think like a citizen of the kingdom of God. Can I finish, please? Verse 3. Even so, when we were children, we were what? In bondage under the elements of the world. When the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those, that's you and I, who were under the law, that we might receive what? The adoption as sons. Hallelujah. Say, I have been adopted. Come on. Yeah. Adopted by the Father, by God the Father. Verse 6, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son, meaning the Holy Spirit or the spirit of Christ, the same thing. Into your hearts crying what? Abba, Father. Therefore, my people of God, you are no longer what? Say, tell the person next to you, you are no longer a slave. Come on. You are no, stop acting like a slave. Stop thinking like a slave. Stop talking like a slave. Stop experiencing bandage. No longer a slave. It says, you're no longer a slave, but a son. Hallelujah. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You're an heir of God. You are an inheritor. And everything Jesus paid the price for is so that you can experience it here and now. Some part of that inheritance is for the future, but some things is to experience now. One example, new heaven and new earth, that's part of your inheritance, that's for the future. The new body that we're going to receive, you, you know you're going to receive a new body. He, God's going to take that body of yours and, and still use it, but he's going to transform it into a glorious body that's what the bible says so that glorious body can't die can't get sick none of that happens all that attacks happens in this natural physical body but thank god we have a covenant in the meantime while this body struggles sometimes to stay together we have access to i am the lord who heals you we have access to jehovah rapha and we say lord can you repair this thing while before the new one comes keep this thing healed so i can use it on earth but I know my tailor-made suit is coming. Hallelujah.